Hi, good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Am I on? I'm on. Okay, good. Never know with these things. Uh, well, I'm Perry and Boring. I am the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Um, we are a trade association that is exclusively working on issues impacting blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. We have had a, uh, an incredible summer <laughs> and an incredible week. Um, earlier uh, this year, as you may have uh, seen, um, a very large social media company decided they were going to enter uh, the crypto space. Um, and that has caused a huge response, a global conversation from regulators, heads of state, members of Congress, and others about what is money, who should control it, uh, and, and how are we going to, 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 to use it in the future. Um, blockchain technology has been around for just over 10 years. Um, and of course, the first application of blockchain was Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency, um, to be used um, as a method of payment. Um, this is uh, what I think one of the most exciting uh, conversations we can be having um, because there are a lot of challenges with our financial system. Um, but of course, um, blockchain technology um, is not just about cryptocurrencies. There's other applications um, outside of financial services. Um, today, I am joined with um, two members of Congress who sit um, and who are members of the House Financial Services Committee. So we will be talking about mo mostly um, issues within uh, that committee since we have them here. And then we're also joined um, by Nathan from the Consumer um, Technology Association. Um, to get started, uh, I'll have each of our panelists introduce themselves. Um, Congressman, it'd be great to, to get an introduction, um, both from your perspective of what you're doing in this space, um, and maybe just share with, uh, with the audience here um, the House Financial Services and uh, some of the activities we have seen um, recently. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you all for sticking around for our panel and for the opportunity to be here in Cleveland again. Uh, so I'm Warren Davidson. I'm a member of the House Financial Services Committee. I'm from Southwest Ohio, Cincinnati Dayton Corridor. Uh, I've been in Congress for about three years after Speaker Boehner resigned. I ended up being the member of Congress that represents that part of our great state. Uh, so when I got to uh, Congress, I brought all these experiences that I didn't know were going to prepare me to uh, deal with the things Congress addresses. I owned a group of small manufacturing companies, and in manufacturing, inherently, you need to uh, process payments. And, in, and uh, in manufacturing, especially over the past uh, 20 plus years, uh, that's involved a fair bit of international uh, finance in terms of moving cash across borders. So that led to some of the frustrations that everyone's dealt with with payments as we've moved into a digital era uh, and lags across boundaries. Initially, we couldn't wire straight to China, for example. So we'd go to Hong Kong and then Hong Kong to China. Uh, and then that led to you know, frustrations with payments. And you learn about the history of this, uh, going back to DigiCash in the 90s, and then see the progression all the way up through Bitcoin and then other instances of FinTech. So when I got to Congress and got involved in the Financial Services Committee, I started working in this space. And uh, so that was uh, 2017 when I started on Financial Services. But as a new member, you don't really get you know, the authority to convene. We had. I thought a great chairman, Jeb Henserling, uh, leading our committee, but uh, we had a long list of um, legacy issues from, say, the Dodd-Frank era, the reforms that were implemented right after the recession. Some worked okay, some not so well, trying to fix those. And so this was down in the queue of priorities. Right. But the IC ICO market was going on, and so um, we started having these hearings that would say, well, this is what uh, you know, a digital wallet is. This is how you purchase you know, a token and store it in a digital wallet. And that was kind of the level of uh, committee hearing we would have. And so I was frustrated with that. And you can't, you can't convene hearings as a, as a junior member, but you can schedule meetings. So we scheduled a meeting, and in September of 2018, we had this great uh, round table at the Library of Congress lots of participation, open calls for papers, and we had you know, literally hundreds of uh, inputs from you know, people in industry, but from universities, from law firms, from accountants, uh, you know, concerned people all over pouring uh, inputs in. And that led to the Token Taxonomy Act, 
which Anthony is now a co-sponsor of. It's a nonpartisan bill that offers to provide the certainty that's missing right now in our economy. So that's consumed a fair bit of my energy in fintech. Uh, and then financial services deals with everything in the market right now. Uh, Maxine Waters is the chairwoman of the committee, and uh, that shifted when Republicans lost control of the House. Okay, thank you. Great, so uh, I'm Anthony Gonzalez uh, from Rocky River, so right, right in everybody's backyard. Um, probably uh, a lot of y'all's members of Congress, uh, or member of Congress. Um, but uh, for me, and my interest in, in block land and blockchain specifically, um, it kind of goes by f what I really ran on, uh, which is I, I spend the overwhelming majority of my time, 90, 95% of my time, um, working on issues specific to the economy, um, specific to the Northeast Ohio economy. Uh, I am somebody who believes that um, for us as a region, uh, to really prosper and take ourselves into the next decade, two decades, um, we need to, to help rebuild uh, a more diverse economy uh, generally. And, and that means diversity on a lot of metrics, but, but by industry as well. And so I think, you know, we will always have tremendous health care here in, in Northeast Ohio and, and great health care assets. We will always have uh, great financial services assets. I see the, the key bank table up front. Um, we have the Cleveland Fed uh, and all, all different um, insurance companies and whatnot. Um, I believe that blockchain technology generally, not just in the crypto space, but generally uh, provides us an opportunity uh, to latch onto an industry that absolutely will grow. This isn't a, an if question for me, it's a when and where. Um, and so if, if we as a region um, embrace the technology and really put in the work, uh, I believe in our ability to lead. Um, and so uh, that's been a perspective that I've had for years um, and, uh, and then to see um, all the energy around this, uh, this conference, both last year and this year, um, and, and some of the development take place uh, has been really exciting. Um, and uh, and as, a, as I've gotten into it as a new member, I was first elected in January. Um, similar to, to Warren, I think I, I found um, some frustration generally with respect to uh, how we approach governing and, and regulating in this space. Um, and, uh, and as a result, we're seeing a lot of things that we would not wanna see. So as a, as a transformative technology, um, for the future, we're seeing it actually leave our shores and go to places like Singapore and, and China and, and places that, uh, frankly, we don't want it to be. We want it here. We want to develop and lead here in this country and in this region. Um, and so we have to get it right. Uh, and, um, and as a member, a freshman member in the minority, um, that has taken the form for me of, of working directly with a lot of our regulators. Um, I'm on the Token Taxonomy Act, which, which Warren has, has spearheaded uh, for the last couple years. Um, but, but in the meantime, uh, my question is, what else can we do outside of the legislation or extra legislatively, if you, if you will? Um, and that, uh, to me, pushes directly into the regulatory environment. So I've, I've been spending a, a good bit of time there just trying to get certainty um, for our market uh, so that we can develop here in this country. So you see this as an economic opportunity for Ohio, but also the entire country? Absolutely, 100%. Um, and like I said, it, this is, this is an, if, an if not when, or this is a when not if. Um, so. Uh, it's happening, it's here. Uh, right now, the, the regulatory regime seems to be um, holding to a strategy of fear. Uh, there's somebody said at some point, hope is not a strategy, I don't think fear is either. Um, and so uh, we need to be, to be very thoughtful about um, how we're developing and allowing innovation to take place. We shouldn't run from it. I understand it has challenges, that's fine. Um, we figured that out for every other piece of technology. This will be no different uh, if we have the will to do it. Thank you. And Nathan, would you introduce us to the CTA and your work in blockchain? Sure, uh, my name is Nathan Trail. I'm from the Consumer Technology Association. CTA is a trade association which supports the $398 billion U.S. consumer technology industry, uh, which also supports about 18 million U.S. jobs. We have about 2,400 member companies. 80% um, of those are small businesses and startups. The rest are some of the world's best known brands and we got involved in this space because a lot of our companies from the large companies that I said are household names to small businesses are really innovating in this space and looking to utilize blockchain uh, to enable business functions in pretty much every form. Um, I work on mostly state and local issues and what I saw um, several years ago was that states are enacting several different types of bills. I think. So far, since 2013, there's been about 230 individual blockchain or digital asset bills. Um, last year, I think about 64 alone, about 20 have passed. So 
what we're trying to do at CTA as a whole is to create a regulatory and legislative environment for these innovative companies, our member companies, to grow. Um, and it's hard to do so when there's different laws and regulations for this technology from state to state. So we're really looking to promote innovation. So what I've been doing for the past several years is traveling around the country working with state legislators interested in this technology, talking to them about what they can do to help promote blockchain technology. Uh, we can get into the types of bills we've seen in the past, but we've really been working with a lot of the advisory committees in individual states making sure that if they are going to introduce bills that they're helpful to blockchain digital assets and helping them thrive. We've seen that in Wyoming. We've also seen examples of bills that, although well-intentioned, maybe didn't um, hit the mark. Maybe they conflict with federal regulations um, or they create more confusion. So in all forms of technology, including blockchain, we're really trying to create a landscape that our member companies can thrive using blockchain. Thank you, Nathan. So why don't we start, Warren, with you. Uh, you have really been uh, an inspiring leader in U.S. Congress for the blockchain space. You're a member of the Blockchain Caucus, and you've um, led uh, the, the Token Taxonomy Act. Um, what one, um, if you can give us an overview of the bill and what it accomplishes, um, and two, what are your goals with this piece of legislation? Yeah. So thanks. So when we when we had our um, roundtable, the goal was really just to listen and find out you know, what is it that everyone agrees on. And so you think about it as a tree, you, know, you start with the roots, you gotta have a good foundation and it goes up, and at some point it starts to branch off, right? So we wanted to get up at least to where the branches start diverging. So, well, if I wanna do this, I go that way. If I wanna do that, I go that way. Common denominator all the way up to as far as we could get. And that's what we created in language. So the biggest thing is, you know, the, the SEC is going about this with a patchwork of enforcement mechanisms uh, you know, as Anthony said, you know, uh, fear, you know, we're just going to scare you. Uh, and look, we don't want fraudsters, but the, the legitimate players in this space are working to end that fraud. And normally, uh, Congress is anxious to regulate something. And I've been able to help make this bipartisan by pointing out to Democrats in Congress, you finally found a Republican that's for regulating something. You should take me up on it. It's a, it's a pretty light touch that I'm looking for. Um, and it's really, the, the, the uh, SEC's got this um, Howey test that defines what's a security. And it's, I mean, it's outmoded, it's a Supreme Court decision that applies to oranges and orange groves. Yep. And, uh, and so we said, well, okay, if you take that framework, you can't completely gut it, but you have to at least make it relevant to what we're talking about. So we created a definition for a digital token that would be considered not a security if it meets four criteria. It's created, not promised, so it's already done, uh, not, not speculative, uh, which gets at one of the components of the Howey test. Two, it's distinct for uh, digital tokens. It's a distributed ledger, not controlled by uh, a central authority, including the creator. So you can't alter it, you can't dilute it, you can't change what it's pegged to, things like that. It's already created, and it's defined in a way that, you know, it's like this really created, and it's distributed ledger, so you can actually have the transparency and accountability that, and security that comes with distributed ledger technology. And then three, um, it's transferable without an intermediary or third party. And then four, it doesn't represent a financial interest in an entity or a corporation. So it's not a security. And if it does that, it's not a security. That doesn't mean that it's, uh, you know, securities laws don't apply. Uh, in fact, if it doesn't meet that test, then Inherently, the SEC would have a default presumption, we're going to take a look at it. But if it does meet that criteria, then you'd be looking to the CFTC or the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, so a good or a service or a commodity. And then the other two things that it does that are really important is it gives a de minimis um, tax exemption that's consistent with fiat currency. So if you change U.S. dollars to British pounds, uh, and then you say, well, I want to go to Europe, or you go down to, or go down to Paris, or you change it to euros, uh, you come back, if you haven't netted out more than $600, you don't pay taxes on that. And most people don't even bother to keep track of it, but when you start moving in... It's um, like 98% of people don't even right. comply with it. And it's the same. So, of, so of this is a real laws. moral hazard with the way that the tax code is done. And frankly, we don't trust that the IRS is going to get it right of their own accord, so why not spell it out? Now, I'd go for a bigger uh, de minimis exemption myself, yeah. but this just mimics current law. Right. So that's more achievable. And then the last thing it does is it deals with custody. So you can't really have something that's transferable without an intermediary in the current custody arrangement because a lot of ways they provide it 
is with a third party that says, yes, I verify this transaction happened. Right. Well, the whole point of a distributed ledger technology is to get rid of those intermediaries. So that's right. the core of the bill. Great. Um, thank you. I totally agree that the regulatory clarity is, I would argue, it is the biggest issue for this space in the United States today. And, and it really comes down to kind of two agencies, the SEC and the CFTC. Um, in, in our conversations with the SEC, there is, and, and even with, with some of your colleagues as well, um, th this idea that companies in this space are trying to arbitrage their way out of being regulated. I mean, they're trying to build their products and services so they aren't outside of the SEC's jurisdiction. But it's, it's, it's funny because that does not mean they're not regulated. It doesn't even mean that they're advocating to not be regulated. They're just saying they're not uh, going to operate, or th these types of projects should not operate within the securities regulation. Right, and a lot of times they're not leaving the United States to uh, avoid our regulations. They're leaving for countries that have regulations. Yeah. They're leaving for places that have certainty right. in law because then they know how they're going to be treated and regulated, not just regulation by enforcement. Right. And, and so what, 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 are, what is the future of this bill? What, what does the legislative process look like? Well, uh, you know, while capital is being scared off by the status quo, Congress is anxious to preserve the status quo. Uh, so that's disappointing. Uh, and, and frankly, the biggest opponent of uh, the entire space is a congressman from Los Angeles, Brad Sherman. Uh, and when Democrats pick chairs of their subcommittees and committees, they go entirely based on seniority. So due to Elijah Cummins passing away, uh, Carolyn Maloney left our Financial Services Committee to be Chairwoman of uh, Oversight, which left an opening on the Capital Markets Subcommittee. And that moved Brad Sherman, who was the next most senior Democrat, into the chair of that. So he's incredibly boastfully hostile to the space, uh, and his subcommittee would need, uh, would need to sign off on it if we follow the default process. Now that doesn't mean Chairwoman Waters couldn't just tell him this bill's moving, and it will, uh, but it, it's a pretty big setback in the House. Uh, over in the Senate, though, we now have uh, the former CEO of BACT uh, appointed to the Senate, uh, and uh, we know she gets the issue, so hopefully we can try to have some momentum in the Senate that hasn't really been there yet. But this bill moving in the House right now is, uh, prospects aren't great. So, it, however, Patrick McHenry, who's the ranking member as a Republican, yep. A uh, supporter agrees in the space. He's got a couple tweaks that he wants. Uh, so he's not a co-sponsor. He wants to make a small amendment to it. Um, but that would move if he were chairman. So I'll be rooting for a, uh, a Republican majority. What a surprise, right? Yeah. But uh, for, for many reasons. But for this bill, that's really the only path this bill has to go forward. Right. And, and what is the um, amendment uh, Chairman McHenry is looking at? Well, I'll let him speak for himself he's, okay. uh, for his ideas, but he does have a couple concerns and he's got a small amendment. He's told me that he would like to change, but he likes the overall framework and the momentum. Sure. Um, Congressman Gonzalez, maybe we'll, we'll ask you about the, the next piece of legislation. So there's been a couple of hearings um, in response to Facebook's uh, Libra project. Uh, most recently, Mark Zuckerberg came and testified um, in front of your committee, and, and part of uh, that was the discussion of a couple bills that have now been introduced into law. Um, the one uh, that's most concerning uh, to us is this Manage Stable Coins, um, our Securities Act. Um, would be interested in, in your thoughts on that bill, um, which would effectively ban a subsect uh, of stable coins because they would consider them securities, right. meaning they would not be able to operate as their creators intended to as a payment uh, mechanism. So uh, kind of what is the general sentiment based on the, the Facebook hearings and um, thoughts on, on this bill? Yeah, I think, so on the Facebook hearings in general, uh, I'd say there was one good thing that happened, which is it forced our committee and much of the country to really take a look at this space uh, in a more thoughtful way. Yeah. Um, and, and so that was a positive. Uh, unfortunately, what we saw, uh, and maybe this isn't surprising, um, is some, some bad pieces of legislative ideas come out of that. Um, one of those uh, being the bill you just cited. Um, the, the good news is I, I don't see that having any path. Um, I really don't. Uh, I mean, I've, I've spoken to, to other members on the committee, um, and there's just not an appetite for it. Um, th but, uh, but I will say that, um, generally speaking, uh, most people didn't, and I, would, I include myself in this, um, didn't love the notion of what the Lieber Project was all about um, and, and how they were trying to go about it. Um, 
you know, my understanding based on the Token Taxonomy Act uh, is that the Libra Association and the Libra Project um, would not pass the, the Token Taxonomy Act test, right, because it's controlled essentially. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that sparked an interesting conversation. Um, that's why, again, why I've kind of gone in, into the path of, well, let me work with the regulators, because when I talk to the companies themselves uh, who are innovating in this space, what I hear isn't, hey, we don't want to be regulated. What I hear is, we actually want to be regulated, but we want to be regulated in a way that's thoughtful and that provides the certainty that we need. Um, so where I've been trying to help out uh, is with the SEC. I've met with each of the commissioners um, and tried to just make that pitch, and, and they're split on it, um, admittedly. Um, but, uh, but really, I, the notion that you're just not going to provide clarity at all and scare companies out of this country and, and push them overseas, um, I think is just a, an insane uh, position to take, but that seems to be what we've done. Um, and, you know, so that, that's where I'm going to continue my work. And again, I, for whatever reason, I, I've decided it might be easier to convince a handful of SEC commissioners than the 435 members of Congress. Um, <laughs> I may be proven wrong in that, but that's, that happens to be the path that I've chosen um, based on the Facebook hearings, but, but all the follow on um, and just looking at the space generally. Yeah, so we, uh, we heard that, that this bill, this managed stable coin bill was um, going to be um, on the calendar to be marked up this week. Um, and and then now, now it's not, so crisis averted um, for the time being. Um, any insights to uh, uh, the, the, the process and, um, and if, if it will move uh, to a markup later on? You know, it, it very well could. Um, you know, and, and here's kind of the thing that frustrates everybody about Congress, which I'll, I'll give you insight into. A lot of what we vote on, both in committee and on the House floor, breaks on pure partisan lines. Yeah. Um, that particular one has one Republican sponsor, but I don't, I think he will be the only Republican who would vote for it. Um, would be my guess. And so if, if it has a path, maybe it gets out of committee into the House floor, um, but I would say there's a less than 1% chance that the Senate takes it up. Um, so, you know, that, that could happen. And wh why is that? You just don't see a, a champion to take it on? No, I don't think so. I mean, it, it, maybe, but right, like the, the Senate is uh, controlled by Republicans right now. It's, it's not a Republican bill, it's a Democrat bill. Um, and, and so I just, I just don't see it having the path um, on that, but also like the intellectual property behind it, the thinking behind it just isn't sound. And I think most, most objective observers would look at that. Even if some people vote for the bill, I think they would look at that and say, I don't actually love this even if I'm voting for it. So. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, the number of people that really understand the issue in Congress is small, but right. as Anthony it's highlighted, like <laughs> yeah, it's not a big population, yeah. but the number has gone up dramatically since Libra. And, and so some people are just reacting to, you know, fears about how Libra was structured without having a thoughtful hearing about the entire topic. Right. So that's what we're pushing for where, you know, frankly, some of the bills that were noticed for markup next week or this week now um, would have been at odds with the Token Taxonomy Act. And while I, I highlighted the prospects look a little grim in committee for this bill, given Sherman's uh, rise to subcommittee chair, mm -hmm. um, it's a 100 percent bipartisan bill. I mean, so we've got Tulsi Gabbard and Eric Saltwell on the left, uh, Darren Soto, Josh Gottheimer. So it's a balanced bill between, it's not a partisan topic. And even at the, the conference we had, you know, people in the space aren't overwhelmingly Republicans. Uh, and they're, they're highlighting, you know, concerns about, well, why is it this way? Why is it working this way? And it's just not something that is partisan. It's a, do you understand it this way or that way? And um, and, and to the bills that Anthony highlighted really are partisan bills. They're not meant to be collaborative. And so we need to have a real hearing where the body, and this goes to how Congress works. You have the witnesses sitting down below and Congress gets their five minutes and we're not even all in the room at the time. And uh, what we really need is post those dialogues to sit down and face one another and have a real discussion about whatever the topic is. And uh, to her credit, Chairwoman Waters offered to do that on blockchain. Uh, however, committee staff below her has been uh, dragging their feet on getting that scheduled because it's so different than what we normally do. Right. So, I, I mean, you, you are both saying that this uh, managed stablecoin bill is a partisan bill, yet it, it does have a Republican co-sponsor on it. That, that's uh, Congressman Goodens from Texas. H how did he end up on this? 
I don't know, I'm good friends with Lance. Um, <laughs> uh, Lance, his wife, and my wife are good friends. Um, you know, I haven't talked to him about, about the issue specifically. Uh, I just know from, from having chatted with, um, obviously with, with Warren, but, but other members of the committee um, on our side that uh, it, his view is, is a minority view. It doesn't mean it's wrong, it just means it's different from, from, from where we're at. Um, so I, I don't know, I'll let him speak for himself. All right. Lance is a great guy, though. I love him. Just disagree with him on this. All right. <laughs> um, interesting. I, I also, uh, in uh, the financial services uh, committee's domain, it is uh, topics related to uh, central banking and, and the Federal Reserve. Um, just recently, uh, the former chairman of the CFTC, Christopher Giancarlo, um, AKA uh, was named uh, Crypto Dad by Twitter after uh, being a staunch av advocate for, for this space. Um, he even uh, went on to say that he believes blockchain is in the national interest of the United States of America and is one of the great leaders and one of the few bright spots that we have had um, in, um, uh, in the regulatory space. Um, since uh, leaving the, the CFTC, um, he has called for uh, the Fed to issue a digital dollar. Um, is this a conversation uh, the committee is, is having in general thoughts on the need for a, uh, a fiat digital currency? You want it or you go I'll start, yeah. So um, where I think the Fed can be most useful is, is providing a clear perspective on, on what they see uh, going forward. Um, whether that's a digital dollar, that's one conversation. Whether they create a sandbox similar to what Singapore did, I think could be another question. Um, but again, I'll go back to what I said earlier, like hope is not a strategy, neither is fear. Um, we had a hearing last week where uh, Secretary Mnuchin basically said he and uh, Fed Chair Powell spoke earlier that morning and decided to put this off for roughly five years. Um, a lot is gonna happen in the next five years, like an infinite number of things are gonna happen in the next five years, specifically in this space. Uh, I think that was a very unacceptable answer to, to basically say we're gonna punt for five years. Um, and so uh, we're gonna follow up from our office uh, to see if, uh, one, to understand that comment a little bit better, um, but two, to, to make sure that uh, the timeline is, is not actually that. That's a good, a good point. So five years ago in, in crypto is right. like an eternity in, yeah. in, in the real world. Five years ago in tech is an eternity. Yeah, so we launched the chamber five yeah. and a half years ago yeah. in July of 2014 as yeah. the, the first ever blockchain uh, trade group. Um, that was before Ethereum had even launched. Mm -hmm. Um, at that time, there was, there was not a blockchain caucus. Um, really, the only thing people knew about blockchain is Bitcoin and that people were using it to buy illegal drugs online. And that was like the extent. Well, I think most of us <laughs> would, would like to go back five years and purchase more Bitcoin. Right, <laughs> right, right, absolutely. Right. But, if, but if you look at five years in that space, as Anthony, Anthony highlighted, you know, that's totally irresponsible. We don't have five years. We're already late to the game. Right. And if you look at the idea of modern finance, this is need, needed, and frankly, even the Fed's actions highlight that they want to deal with part of the issue, which is faster payments. They have a faster payments initiative. They do. And frankly, they had uh, encouraged banks to invest in this space uh, and fintech companies to invest in this space, and they said they were gonna stay out of it. So now these private sector companies put their own capital and intellectual property at risk because they believe they're gonna have a space that they can innovate in. And then the Fed says, no, we're actually gonna take that over. Yeah. We're gonna do the financial, pay the, the, the faster payment system, but they're gonna do it in a outdated way inherently because they're not gonna use blockchain. So you could get it done with blockchain, you could use a tokenized dollar, and, and if, you, if you really actually took the principles of uh, distributed ledger technology, maybe you could quit diluting the value of our US dollars by quantitative easing and other methods, they won't. And the big thing is, is if they, if, they, if they do it that way, look at all the intermediaries you could do. I mean, you just hold up your wallet, and this is a traditional wallet, and it's got all these little symbols on it and everything else, and these companies uh, make lots of money by scraping your data, but also by processing fees. Look at how much can happen in this space for the tokens that represent methods of payment moving uh, stores of value from me to you or, you know, multiple parties all seamlessly. So I do think we could use a tokenized dollar. Uh, but my fear is that if we don't deal with restoring privacy to our financial lives, 
uh, as the Fourth Amendment is supposed to provide and does not currently in banking, that we really run the risk that, frankly, Libra's launch highlighted the fear that everyone has, that if Facebook, who has all this data about us, mm -hmm begins to filter financial transactions the same way they're filtering content, that gets a little creepy. You're like, wait, I, I could give you $20 for whatever we agree right now without an intermediary. Facebook's, Facebook's gonna be the intermediary? Well, I'm not really sure I like that. Well, it gets even creepier if it's the central government, right? And, and so that's really the experiment China is trying to go down. And they're, they're creating even with facial recognition and all the ways they're collecting the per personal data um, a social credit score. And they're looking at potentially being able to approve whose transactions get processed. And to me, I always say, look, I've read a number of these dystopian future books, and you can see many elements of them. People certainly spoken about them lately a lot. But the one I think about is the book of Revelation, where some people's financial transactions aren't possible. And I think, why would we want that when we could create a future that doesn't enable that with blockchain? So the, uh, well, uh, Christopher John Carlo recently joined um, our advisory board at the Chamber of Digital Commerce, and I've, I've had the opportunity to talk with him in detail about um, his proposal and, and why he's so passionate about blockchain and this topic. And as a former um, uh, federal regulator, he says, you know, uh, you know, look around the world at what other countries are doing. Um, and we just take a second just, just to, to dive in, in, into China. They are, um, they have been building their central bank digital currency project for over five years. And they have um, uh, uh, applied for over 70 patent applications on this project. I mean, I don't even know if I can think of another product that has been brought to market where we've put, you know, for 70 patents have been applied just on that one system. I mean, this is of, of absolute magnitude. Um, and the fear is that we have, uh, uh, other nations around the world that are actively attacking the United States dollar and the world reserve currency status um, by trying to build something better, faster, cheaper, stronger, more efficient, all of the above. Um, and that by the lack of action on behalf of the US government is effectively ceding our national security to these other nations. Specifically um, that one. The, the, the na yeah, so the, the national security conversation of how high the stakes are if we don't act, and, and what the, the, the real threat is. Um, so I, I, I do think that there, there is an argument to be made there. Um, but also what's so great about the United States of America is our private sector, and having the private sector lead the innovation. Due to the government's lack of an action in this space, our, our private sector has stepped up, and, and there is a lot of uh, an, an amazingness happening all throughout this space, and, and stable coins kind of being one of those that, that really directly correlate with this idea of a digital dollar. Um, but if we don't have a regulatory environment that promotes and supports the private sector's innovation, um, that will go overseas, and both of you guys ha have talked about that. Uh, what should the United States government be doing to ensure that we are the leaders? Not just so you know we're, we we have the the, the world reserve currency um, status preserved, but beyond that, um, how, how can we be leaders in blockchain? Well, I mean, you highlighted a huge issue for me, which is the U.S.-China relationship broadly, right? Like, I think the biggest existential threat we have as a country uh, is what happens with China and how China grows up as a as an international country. Uh, or as an international economic power. Yeah. Um, I think technically speaking, the, the Chinese version of, of, a, of a yen, a digital yen, will probably be a permissioned, uh, not permissionless, which means uh, that the Chinese government will have all the access to that data, right? And we'll be able to, I would imagine, will be able to and will uh, look at it and use it in whatever form or fashion they want. Um, that should create some urgency for us. That's something that should scare all of us. I, I don't believe China is going to displace us as the, the world reserve currency, um, uh, certainly not in the near term. Uh, but I do believe um, that if we allow them to take the lead on this specific issue, uh, that it creates a whole host of uh, security challenges, generally speaking, right. um, just because they're going to have ownership over that data, ownership and control. Um, it's a huge issue. It's one we shouldn't 
sign up for or, or uh, help facilitate, but by our inaction, uh, we have in fact done that. Um, Mark Zuckerberg highlighted that. It was one of the few things he said in the hearing that I think was correct. Um, and so, um, you know, that's something that we need to, we absolutely need to keep our eye on. Yeah, totally in terms of, uh, you know, we need to take action. We need to take action in a way that um, is forward looking, not preserving the system we have today, which frankly a lot of countries resent. I mean, we use our power uh, to shape markets around the world with sanctions, and that's a, that's a valuable tool. Uh, we use the fact that we have the reserve currency to monitor, every, spy on everyone's finances, uh, and FinCEN does that for us as a country. In a way, it keeps us safer, but the future is actually going to have a large portion of its economy around the planet that is different than that, that is truly distributed, that there is privacy, and that's not the same as secrecy. You know, we've solved things like Mt. Gox as a country. Uh, you know, people have solved these cases because the distributed ledger does provide public key. So you can look at um, where things go. So there's not true, true secrecy. There is a certain level of privacy. And that's the way our country was founded. And I think if we go back to those roots and uh, on, on civil liberties, and yet we look forward to the future in technology, we really can do that. And I think we could actually go a long way uh, by dealing with our own monetary policy f problems, which is actively destroying the value of our money yeah. uh, through broken fiscal policy, spending more than we have, and monetary policy that's enabling it with quantitative e easing. If you take the core logic of Bitcoin, Bitcoin was created to address this. Now that doesn't mean it's the only thing that can, there's certainly a lot of other innovations in it. And I think the other piece is that if you look at the promise of blockchain for FinTech, for transformation, for all the jobs, if we weren't entitled to have Silicon Valley in America, it could have been the Loire Valley, right? It could have been somewhere else. Um, and we got the regulata regulatory framework right. Um, we want to do that for blockchain, and if we equate everything in this space with currency, um, then we're going to get it wrong. We have to get to where we're talking about digital assets broadly, and currency is one aspect of it. Sloppy language on cryptocurrency is part of it, and that's why the taxonomy is part of the... Right, recognizing the full potential of right. blockchain technology, which is not just about financial services, but effectively any asset, tangible or intangible, could be tokenized, tracked, traced, and recorded on blockchain technology. So this will apply to, I would argue, almost every area Absolutely. within our economy. Nathan, on the state level, um, a lot of action, action happening. You mentioned there's been um, almost 300-something bills that were introduced throughout the states um, just in this past year, and in the year before, in 2018, that number was, I think, less than 70. Um, so, so what's interesting to, to you, and what, what states do you think are getting it right? Right, so I'd, I'd just like to echo uh, what was said before. Um, you know, we were lucky to have Silicon Valley here, but it wasn't completely by accident. I mean, the U.S. Yeah. didn't become a hub for innovation, and the powerhouse that it is completely by accident. There was a thoughtful approach that was taken to make sure that these innovative companies can thrive. And we're at a time now where companies will go elsewhere. If there is a better regulatory environment, they will go elsewhere. Um, a lot of my member companies are just asking, you know, we just want to understand what the regulations are. They want regulations in place that make sense for them to grow. And you know, these are companies, some of them are small businesses, and, and some have big policy teams, and they're saying, we have a hard time really understanding how we can operate. And it's even more complicated when you think about the, all the states that we have and, and the various um, actions that are happening at the state level. The states can introduce and implement legislation at a much faster rate. Yeah. Um, so if you're gonna be operating across state lines, it can be almost impossible to do so depending on the technology that you're using. So certain states like Wyoming have done a great job. Florida, Illinois has a great um, working group. And th these are great measures. There's also, um, I guess the second biggest bucket of state regulations or legislation that we've seen is um, creating sandboxes that really allow for these technologies to grow. We've seen it work in other countries such as Estonia. Um, and it's so important to do that. What we're doing is, like I said, we're really working to educate state legislators at this point to teach them about what this technology is. I think there, there really is a lack of understanding of the basic functions of blockchain and digital currency at all levels of government. And that is so important because when there's a lack of understanding with this or really any emerging tech, you see a counter effect where there's, it's, there's legislation enacted sometimes out of fear or just misunderstanding sometimes well-intentioned, but does the wrong thing. Um, so right now, the, the states are kind of uh, 
more of a topsy-turny turny landscape right now, so we're really working to kind of harmonize that. We're here in um, Ohio today, um, the Block Land uh, Cl Cleveland um, uh, event. Uh, the organizers ha have invested a lot into this community to help put uh, Cleveland um, and Ohio um, on the map. Um, what do you see as the opportunity um, for Ohio? And also, we have a lot of um, not just U.S. representatives, but a lot of um, local representatives. I think we have the lieutenant governor coming. Um, he'll be on stage a little bit later um, throughout the day. Um, what should Ohio be thinking about um, specifically, and, and where do you see um, Ohio fitting into the, the national conversation? Sure. There's some incredible companies here in Ohio, and, and there's no reason um, Ohio can't be the leader in blockchain technology. It's really important to foster um, innovation. I, I Really what I recommend the legislators in Ohio do is work with the companies that are innovating in this space and ask them what they need. Um, there needs to be a dialogue, and industry really needs, also industry needs to step up and be more vocal to our legislators. I, I think that's absolutely needed. But if there is going to be new introduce, in legislation introduced, it needs to be with a consultation of industry. So I think if Ohio wants to continue with the path that they're on, um, they need to work with the innovative companies that they have here in their home state to make sure that the legislation is helpful. Can I comment on that? Of course. Yeah, so um, this was uh, a, a big topic of conversation for a, what I call a field trip um, that we led uh, out to Silicon Valley. Bern, I don't know, if Bern, I'm sure Bernie's in the audience somewhere. Um, but um, it was Bernie Moreno and myself, uh, Case Western, Cleveland State, um, and uh, some other entrepreneurs from the area. We all went out and met with, did a crypto roundtable, and then met with a handful of companies um, out west, and I um, had some contacts out there. And we, we sat down and asked that exact same question. How can we lead? What do we need to do? Um, doing exactly the approach that was just recommended, just ask the companies, what do you need? Um, and the immediate response was uh, bank charters. Um, having bank charters, a favorable bank charter uh, environment, uh, could be helpful on that front. Um, and so since then, we've been working um, with uh, Governor, Lieutenant Governor Husted's uh, office and, uh, and some other folks across the state to try to help kind of glide that path. Um, I will say this, uh, Lieutenant Governor, I, I believe, and the governor, are doing an incredible job um, in, not just in, in blockchain, but, but innovation broadly. Um, and I'm really excited to see the work that they do. But I, I, I know that the, the message that you just gave uh, is well received here in Ohio. And so I'm very optimistic. And I think you know, regionally, uh, the question for us is, are we doing what we need to do regionally to make sure that those jobs are here and not Columbus or Cincinnati or wherever? Yeah, yeah, yeah very similar on the same topic. Um, you know, Jobs Ohio, huge resource for, for Ohio, and they're doing a great job of recruiting companies and making sure they have the tools to be competitive as people are looking at launching uh, or relocating. Uh, Jobs Ohio is a great tool for our state, and, uh, and so I'm impressed with JP, JP and Asif, who's now the leader of that, and the team there met with them talking about uh, this space and others. And I think lastly, to Anthony's point, highlighting even the people that he had on his trip, you know, the educators. So we meet with, even with our high schools, to talk about, um, you know, not just STEM, but like this space in particular. Uh, because if you look at later in the week, we're going to talk cybersecurity. Just, just in Southwest Ohio, we have 4,000 open cybersecurity jobs. And when you look at what does cybersecurity better than blockchain, you look at this, it's so secure that people trust that it's worth roughly $8,000 to put into that secure space mm -hmm. uh, on Bitcoin, as an example. And it's a belief in the security of it. Absolutely. Well, Ohio, you're incredibly fortunate to have Congressman uh, Warren Davidson, Anthony Gonzalez, representing um, you in Congress. We have two. Uh, there are uh, not a ton of folks in Congress that really get this, um, but two here who um, have really taken the time to make that personal investment to really understand what this is all about not just understand it, but also to lead by example. And these are incredibly important conversations that we need to be having here in Ohio, um, but also in Congress. And, and thank you both um, for your leadership and for your support. And also thank you um, to Nathan and the CTA um, for your interest in blockchain. Uh, CTA is a massive force to be reckoned with, so it's wonderful to see such great um, other organizations that are taking the time to, um, to understand this and to get this right. Um, help me thank our panelists for joining us for the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.